Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. Hello, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Owning your own home means success, security, opportunity, and wealth. It's the American dream. But for far too long and for far too many black and brown people, it wasn't just a dream deferred. It was a dream denied, legally denied by laws such as redlining and discrimination and lending. Today, it's against the law to discriminate in housing based on race. But the reality tells a different story. Up next on Another View, one woman's cautionary tale of lowball appraisals and how changing one thing more than doubled her home's worth. The devaluation of black home ownership. That's next on Another View, right after this news from NPR and WHRV News. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. We have a very interesting show for you today. If you are at all a homeowner or have thought about buying a house um, or living in a metropolitan area where it is a predominantly black neighborhood, you really want to hear this show. But before we get into that, two very important things I want to bring to your attention. If you live in the city of Norfolk, and you have a child that will be three or four by September 30th of this year, now is the time to register that child for preschool. Preschool matters. And Norfolk Public Schools wants you to know that you can go online to uh, www.npsk12.com. So that's npsk 12 Dot com and register your child for preschool if your child will be three or four by September 30th. Very important uh, so that you get your student, your child um, up to speed and into school as early as possible to give them a heads up and start on life. And also, I hope that you will join me and Ms. Elizabeth Eccles and others for the Hope for the Future concert given by the Virginia Symphony Orchestra. It's a Harmony Project concert. Uh, This is an outreach effort by the Virginia Symphony Orchestra to bring their music to the community. Uh, It is Saturday, this coming Saturday, June 26th at 530 at 2nd Calvary Baptist Church, which is located at 2940 Corporal Avenue in Norfolk. And there will be music. Musicians from the symphony orchestra in a special healing event as we begin recovering from the pandemic together. The concert is free. It is open to everyone. And please come out and join us. That is Saturday, 5.30 p.m. at Second Calvary Baptist Church. I sure hope to see you there. So the housing market is hot, interest rates are low, and homes are selling way above asking price as inventory is also very low. But according to a Brookings study, if you live in a neighborhood that is at least 50% African American, the value of your home on average is 23% less than the price of a comparable home in a predominantly white neighborhood. So why is racial bias so prevalent in real estate and what can we do about it? Joining us today on Another View is Ms. Carlette Duffy. She's a homeowner in Indianapolis with a cautionary tale that she's going to share with us. Hi, Carlette. How are you? Hello, Ms. Barbara. (laughs) Thank you for having us on the show today. Oh, thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to hear the story. Um, Ms. Amy Nelson, she's the executive director, Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana. How are you, Amy? I'm great. Thanks so much for bringing attention to this issue. Oh, not a problem. Thank you for being with us. And Mr. Andre Perry, Senior Fellow with the Brookings Metropolitan Policy Program, a scholar in residence at American University, and a columnist for the Heckinger Report. And he's also the author of a new book called Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. And he's also one of the authors of the Devaluation of Assets in Black Neighborhoods Report by the Brookings Institution. How are you, Andre? 
I'm doing well. It's a pleasure <laughs> to be with you. Thanks so much. So, Carla, I'm going to start with you. You know, um, I guess a couple years now, 2019, I believe, was when this process started. Um, you decided you wanted to refinance your home. Tell us a little bit about what was going on and why you d- were making that decision. So, um, in 2019, September 2019, uh, my grandmother passed away. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and so the the home was then put into the family trust. Mm-hmm. And so I talked to my aunt and my uncle and it let them know that I wanted to, to purchase the home to keep it in the family. Um, the house was built by my grandfather. Mm-hmm. It's in um, the same historic neighborhood that I live in, historic black neighborhood. Um, our neighborhood was the um, first sweat equity program ever in the nation um, to allow or to help um with government support, black homeowners or black black families to mm-hmm. purchase homes. Um, and so uh, my sister, who lives in the same neighborhood, had her home appraised in 2019 and hers appraised for um, 198 at that point. So if um, our homes are very, very similar. And so that was when I decided to um, have my home refinanced in order to pull the equity out so that I could purchase my grandmother's home. So, so you and, you were trying to continue to build family wealth then by keeping the real estate in, within the family. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because I would love to have you know my, my daughter and my granddaughter mm-hmm. live in that home um, and then eventually uh, purchase that home from me um, so that we can keep it in the family. And... Um, so then February of 2020, um, you know, when COVID hit and I actually just before COVID hit, I started to do the process with the first company, mm-hmm. um, which I just called the mortgage broker that I used when I purchased my home originally in 2017. Mm-hmm. And he told me he was with a new, a new um, mortgage company and would I like to move forward with them? And I said, sure, let's do it. So um, that's when I went through the first process. And they wound up appraising your house for how much? One hundred and twenty-five thousand. And and you purchased the home for how much? Um, a hundred thousand. Okay, so twenty-five thousand dollars in equity. Um, they said, um, in that two year, and you purchased home in twenty seventeen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And actually, by the by twenty seventeen, um, or actually by twenty twenty, I had um paid off ten thousand dollars um on the principal. Okay. Um, on my home. So it was roughly 90000 that I owed at the time. Okay. All right. So you got that appraisal. Were you surprised? Were you? I was definitely surprised um, at the the amount. And as I started to um, read through the appraisal, that's when red flags started to go off. Such as? Me. Such as? So um, the appraisal was uh, talking about covid um, a lot and in my mind I'm thinking what does that have to do with the value of my home and basically saying you know maybe mm-hmm. you should do this later um, and then another concern was um, when they discussed um, other homes that were um, potentially similar um, in nearby neighborhoods but had um, higher quality of construction so it's a superior quality of construction. So there's a um, a few neighborhoods. Our our neighborhood is just so rare and so interesting because um, we're working to maintain the integrity of the historical um, value of our neighborhood um, by asking you know our families to the families in the neighborhood to you know have succession plans in place so that they can keep their homes mm. in the families. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, let me ask you this, um, Carlette, because since we're in Indianapolis and we're here on the East Coast, and can you give me a, just a general sense? If someone were to to um, talk about your neighborhood, would they say mm-hmm. it was a poor neighborhood, a middle class neighborhood? I mean, just give me a sense of of what's going on there. Um, you know, I, I hear you saying, you know, we're trying to get our families to keep the, the homes in process. So I'm assuming it's what's considered a middle class neighborhood. But but give us a sense of, of the neighborhood itself. It is a it is. A, I guess you could describe it as a middle class neighborhood. It's with 180 homes. 80 percent of them are still owner occupied and okay. they're owned by either 
um, the original builders, we still have, I think, five original builders alive um, in the neighborhood or their descendants. Mm. And so um, there's no crime in our neighborhood, which is crazy, but it, it's the reality. There's very, very, very little. There's, um, mm-hmm. And it's very near downtown. Um so are you surrounded by other after. are you surrounded by other neighborhoods that are either um, may have a higher crime rate or are are all white or are you or is it a mixture? We're, we're surrounded actually by all of the above, which is okay. really <laughs> so. So like to the south, the direct south of our neighborhood and to the east, those are neighborhoods that were originally black or are now gentrified. Okay. So, especially to the south, um, there's a neighborhood called Ransom Place, and it has the exact same history as our neighborhood in terms of um, the black development that occurred there in the 50s and 60s. And um, that neighborhood has been completely gentrified. And so we're trying to keep that from happening in our area. We're right next to um, a large college. Um, there's a lot of um, technical developments that are happening around our area. There's a lot of um, the hospitals, one of the major hospital networks are, are expanding in our area. There's a lot that's happening around us. Mm-hmm. And so in us trying to hold on and, and preserve um, the history and integrity of our community, um, it's been a battle um, in that aspect. So I'm going to move the story along because I'm going to bring in our other guests and, and kind of get to the meat of the issue. But after you got that $125,000 appraisal, you decided you're going to do it again and see well, if you I got a different I re- result. I okay. bought that with the bank and I said, I don't okay. agree with this. So they said that I need to provide them with additional comps. Gotcha. So that's when I purchased um, a CMA report and provided that um, my sister's uh, um her um, appraisal from 2019, I provided all of that information that I was told by the bank that I, they were sticking by that number and that if I wanted to move forward, then that's the number that I'll have to use. And I said, I'm not, I'm not using it. Okay. And also, at that point in time, my interest rate was 3.9, and they were offering me 4. Mm. And I didn't understand that either. So then I went to, the, to my own bank said, hey, don't leave us. You know, we want to keep you as a, as a client. Um, let us see how we can help you. I said, okay, great. So then I moved forward with them. And at this point, it, as I did in the first one, providing all of my demographic information. And um, so the interest rate that they offered was 3.75. Mm-hmm. Um, so just roughly a quarter percentage under where I was already at. And um, they did the entire process, and the appraisal came back at 110000 so fifteen thousand dollars less than the first appraisal. Oh, with only within only a few months of each other. And so when I asked the bank, I'm like, okay, so how does my home lose fifteen thousand dollars in value? You know, in only a few months. And even they were like, you know, we don't understand how that's possible. You know, we don't know why that occurred. And so I was challenging that appraisal and mm-hmm. um, provided the same information and. With that situation, they basically said, um, "You, if you want to move forward, you have to stick with this. We have to use this appraisal. And what was really stressing me was that I was going from an FHA loan to a conventional. Mm-hmm. So I didn't understand why I couldn't get a new appraisal. So I decided not to move forward with them as well. So then there was a third bank that I went to um, that I applied to. And um, with them... <laughs> They offered me an interest rate. And this is also going from a, a FHA to a conventional, and they offered me an interest rate of five percent, and I just didn't even bother with them. Mm. So, so the company you ultimately wound up going with, that where you wound up getting an appraisal that you felt was much more in in, um, in line with the with what you thought was the value of your home. Um, how tell us about that process? What did you do differently that time well, than the to- others? I went to a community meeting, and um, that's when um, that Amy was also attending. And mm-hmm. Amy was talking about um, um, consent decrees with banks in terms of how they were performing under them, and whether or not they were doing what they were um, that what they had outlined they would do to help communities of color that they had um, been abusing in the past. And um, 
when she she also brought up um, this article from the New York Times talking about um, appraisal discrimination that happened in Florida. And so, um, and it was just kind of coincidence at the very same time, a friend of mine was emailing me um, about this appraisal um, situation that happened in Florida because I had been just like on edge talking to everyone about how frustrated I was and and whether or not I was crazy and, and am I not doing um, what I should be doing? You know, should I accept these costs? Should I say that mm-hmm. this is the value of my home? Um, but it just didn't sit well with me. And so I couldn't accept it, especially when there was a $15,000 decrease in just a few months mm-hmm. when all other property values were going up. So um, when I saw that article, I decided to whitewash my home and removing all pictures um, of my family, myself. Um, all black artwork. I even went so far as to remove uh, African print clothing from my um, from your closet, from my, my my closet. Um, and it just I removed books um, just because I I was just in my mind. I I was just going through like this frenzy of what is it that it says is black here, you know? So mm-hmm. um, so I whitewashed my home. And, uh, and asked a friend of mine's husband um, to stand in for me as my brother. And um, I contacted the appraisal company um, only via email. And when I did the application for this, um, with the, the current, my current bank, um, I did not disclose any of my demographics. And they got, gave me a 2.9 interest rate. And um, so then um, he sat in for me. And he was at your new appraiser back. Yeah, he was at your home when the appraiser came. Yes. And th- and you were not. No, I was not. And okay. he actually spoke to them to set the appointment, all of that. I didn't want to speak to them. I didn't want them to hear my voice, any of that. So um he sat in for the appraisal. Um, he let me know when it was over. I went home and he was just like, you know, it was nothing. You know, they didn't really have a lot to ask. And I said, Okay, great. In a few days, I got my new appraisal back and came back at two fifty nine, two hundred and fifty nine thousand yes. over as opposed to the one twenty five and the one one fifteen. Yes, ma'am. That you received, Amy. Is that unusual? Is that something that that uh, you've seen in your work with the fair housing? You know, prior to Carlette, uh story going public, we had not received that many complaints alleging housing discrimination. I think for a lot of people, they just didn't know what to do or that they would be listened to. And, you know, this appraiser is supposed to be the expert. You know, they're the ones whose opinion is supposed to matter. And and we've also heard from the appraisal industry since we filed this case that over 90% of requests for reconsiderations fail. So it's a dawning process. I will say that since Carlette's story has gone public, in addition to, you know, some other stories since last fall that have been making the news, we are hearing more people speaking out to our offices and fair housing centers around the country because they're like, this this isn't right. This doesn't feel right. And at least right now, we hope that people feel that their voices will be heard. Mm-hmm. Amy, I mean, I'm sorry, Carlette, you, you talked about the fact that you got pushback even from family and friends saying, oh, come on, Carla, this is not race. This is not, you know, don't look at it that way. How? Talk to me about that, how that made you feel. And also the whole process of having to strip your identity from your home and not even be there for your own appraisal in order to get what you feel you deserve. What did that do to you psych- psychologically? If, you know, with everything that was happening in 2020, losing loved ones, you know, just dealing with the isolation of, you know, going through COVID, working from home, you know, it just, it felt like, you know, like you're just in an alternate universe, you know, where <laughs> when you feel something in your, not even just in your gut, in your soul, that this is not right. It's mm-hmm. like, there's something wrong here. And this I need to find out. And I just, I just had this drive to find out what was wrong. And because of everything that had been going on um, in 2020, it, that was outside of my control. It felt like, you know, this is one thing that I'm not allowing to, you know, just 
just take control of me. I'm going to take control of it. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why I I felt like I had to fight. I had to fight to see, to prove that this, that what I was seeing and what I was understanding was the actuality. That it was the reality. So, and, and the gentleman that you had step in for you, he was the husband of a friend, but he was a white guy, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Who? Who? So. So. As far as the appraiser knew, there. When he came to your house, there was nothing that said African American. Period. Nothing. Nothing. Andre, when you you've done the studies, you've been working on this for quite a while. When you hear Carlette's story, your reaction? Oh, it's it's quite common. You ask, is this something you see all the time? Mm-hmm. The research shows that it's happening all the time. Um, we did a study a few years ago. Um, where we compared homes and um, prices of homes in black neighborhoods and compared them to the homes in white neighborhoods. And, and intuitively, a lot of people will say um, um, homes in black neighborhoods are lower because of crime, because of education. But those are things you can control for or attend to in a study. And so that's what we did. We controlled for education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics. And we found that homes in black neighborhoods, on average, are underpriced by 23%, about 48000 per home. Cumulatively, that's about $156 billion in lost equity. In, in Indianapolis, on average, they're um, um, underpriced by about $18,000. Um, in in the Nor- Norfolk, Virginia Beach area, you're talking about $25,000. But, but an, an individual case, the case, it can range from, as we've seen across the country, where um, homeowners are losing hundreds of thousands of dollars in equity. And, and so this is a pervasive problem. Now, and there's another way to interpret my data. And this is something that um, w- um, was in some of the comments we heard earlier. Mm-hmm. When people look at black neighborhoods, it's almost as if the, the price point is almost as if people see twice as much crime than there actually is, worse education than there actually is. And so it compels them to lower the value. And because appraisals are, are very subjective in nature, um, the racial biases come through. And so this is a pervasive problem in black neighborhoods in, in particular, but it's also a problem for black homeowners, because it's not just um, the the wealth that extracted uh, uh, in black neighborhoods. When people see blackness, it compels them to devalue the property, and and, and that's what happened um, with Carlette. And Andre, this is how that also happens whether you are a black homeowner in a predominantly black neighborhood or a black homeowner in a predominantly white neighborhood. I don't know. In the yeah, New York it, Times article, um, D.L. Hughley, the comedian, um, talked about his devaluation of his home, um, you know, living in the San Fernando Valley. Um, but yet his uh, appraisal came in way, way under what everybody else's in the area did. Yeah, there, there seems to be what's happening when you have any kind of object, including people, obviously, obviously people and other objects. Um, that, that it's if it's black, if, if there's blackness involved for many appraisers, lenders, real estate agents, it, it signals um, um, worse condition. And so, um, you know, and, and likewise, we shouldn't have white saviors. Um, we should have concrete policy. But what you what you're seeing when you have these white standards is the intrinsic value of whiteness. Because in, in, you know, my study essentially tried to do this. If you helicoptered a home in a black neighborhood and put it in a white neighborhood with similar social circumstances, what would the price, how would the price change? And, and it's clear that Carlette's case, um, if that home was in a white neighborhood, it would be valued at, at, at the, what are ultimately what she got. Mm-hmm. But people see this on their own. They they can look across the street. They can look down the, at the next town. They can see the same construction by the same builder, and but yet they're getting a lower price. And so clearly we need um, reforms, particularly around accountability, because that is theft. That equity that is lost is another home. It's 
It's a college degree. It's a business. It is um, um, intergenerational wealth. And it and can so never, you, you can never catch ahead. up. You can also never catch up. So if you buy the home at a lower value because it's already been devalued, then when you you never catch up on that equity um, as it, because you're always behind the eight ball. Is that right? That is it. That's exactly right. You know, in this country, wealth is such a predictor for other outcomes. So if you have wealth, you have better health, you have better education, you have all these different things. We actually think, uh, and some people think of the reverse. You think, oh, I should go to school to get wealth. Well, no, it's actually wealth gets you better a better education. It gets you a better job. It gets you all these better outcomes. And so um, if you're constantly um, devalued, and, and remember, housing is the primary way most people um, accrue wealth, wealth in this country. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're being devalued, you're always going to have worse um, outcomes in other quality of life measures. If you're just joining us, we're talking about racial bias and home ownership with homeowner Carlette Duffy, Amy Nelson, executive director of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, and Arthur researcher and columnist Andre Perer, Perry, senior fellow of the Brookings Institution. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call to join our conversation. Um, I want to ask you, um, Carlette and or Amy, let me go to you. So when Carlette came to you to say, what's going on? <laughs> um, what what are you guys doing in order to address what has happened to her? Sure. So first of all, when she came to us, you know, we conducted our own investigation, which is what fair housing centers across the country, you know, do to determine uh, if there is evidence of a violation of fair housing laws. And we certainly felt that there was that evidence and, has, and have helped her in filing complaints with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We've also been trying to raise, you know, national attention about needed changes to the lending and appraisal industry. And as Dr. Perry, you know, spoke about, about how key um, home ownership is to wealth building. Here, you know, for most Americans, the, our homes are our most valuable asset. And at the end of the day, it should not come down to a single person's opinion as to what is the value of that home. Mm -hmm. And so the appraisal industry itself is not at all diverse. It's one of, according to a recent labor statistics report, it's one of the it's of 400 uh, industries, you know, study. It was the least diverse industry of those studied. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an outdated process when it comes to how appeals can work. As I mentioned before, if over 90% of requests for reconsiderations fail, that tells me that process is broken. So we need a more transparent appeal process, something that's more formalized as part of that. We need to increase appraiser diversity. We need more access to public data. And a lot of the you know, government agencies already have a lot of appraisal data. And we need access to that data, similar to the data that we get from lenders, uh, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, that allows us to analyze as to whether or not these lenders may be committing discrimination, mm -hmm. and we need that for appraisals, you know, as well. And then lastly, we need to address the historic discrimination that Carlette's neighborhood, so many neighborhoods across the country have suffered from redlining and other policies that have devalued these homes for so many decades, and evaluate whether or not we need to continue using comps or not when they already have the discrimination baked into them. Mm. So are there any checks and balances at all right now within the appraisal industry? To, so to flag it, this kind of thing? It's a very cumbersome process for homeowners like Carlette to address. Typically, these are managed through um, state licensing type boards. So there are processes there, but it's, they're very often very difficult to figure out to go through. Uh, some attorney general's offices may have a complaint filing process there. Again, those um, may not always be the best venue. Uh, housing discrimination complaints, if you can allege race, color, national origin, gender-based discrimination, mm -hmm. that process is there. Um, but again, the, the unfortunately, the burden should not be on the victim to have to navigate this field, and it is, unfortunately. And the CFPB recently um, is evaluating you know, some different things on there. There might be a complaint filing process that's there. You know, we need something. One of the things we've been advocating for is that, you know, the appraisal industry has to have in their documents information about fair housing rights and where people can go if they mm -hmm. feel 
that they received um, an unfair appraisal. Getting that'd be something so simple to be changed, but yet would allow so many um, possible victims of discrimination to understand what their options were under law. Four four zero two six six five or one eight hundred nine four zero two two four zero are the numbers to call to uh, talk. Join our conversation. Have you had your home appraised? Have you thought about whether or not your appraisal was less than maybe your neighbors or 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 the same house that you've seen built in yet in another neighborhood. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. So Andre, you talked about, um, I pulled up the report from your report, uh, Virginia Beach, Norfolk, Newport News um, uh, area. And the median home value of majority black neighborhoods was $164,254. And the estimated home value in the absence of devaluation, meaning what? What does that mean before I tell the people the number? Yeah, if if essentially you remove the drags of racism <laughs> um, from uh, the, the appraisal, or not, not just appraisals, but the valuation process. Um, that's what the number is. Okay. And so that number for Hampton Roads, as opposed to the 164254, which is the median home value, uh, it would be $189,020 instead without the devaluation. That's a, um, a 14% difference uh, in those. That's right. It, Go ahead. And mm-hmm. what it's saying is so many of our homes are actually un- below market rate below what it should be. And again, if we, if we helicoptered the uh, home and, and placed it in a, in a white neighborhood with similar social circumstances, again, we control for all that, mm-hmm. um, it would increase in value in your uh, neck of the woods by uh, roughly $25,000. Now, in Lynchburg, Virginia, oh. <laughs> I was stunned when I saw this one. So the median home value, according to your report, is 128556 But the estimated median home value in absence of devaluation is $289,619. That's an 81% difference. 81% difference. Um, wow. Rochester, New York. 65% difference. You know, and so what's interesting is just as we can calculate this, um, that should provide homeowners some general sense of where what their home should be worth in general. Mm-hmm. And it should, if, if you get a, a an estimate well below that, it should trigger some type of investigation. And so, but th- this is the problem. See, we look at homes in the entire metro area. What appraisers do is they look at homes within a particular neighborhood to get their comp. Now, what's problematic about that, if you're always comparing a home that's being discriminated against uh, in, a, in an area that's been discriminated against and only comparing them to other homes, you essentially just recycle the discrimination over and over and over again. And you see this all the time. You have solidly middle-class neighborhoods, no crime, no, no issues, <laughs> yet they're, they're lower in value than their counterparts. And that's what's happened in, in, in Carlette's situation, because I, I looked at the, these neighborhoods in those areas, and they should be pr- uh, priced a lot higher. Now, the, the problem with this entire mess is that if I wave a magic wand to raise home prices, it might help the current homeowners. It would help the current homeowners, Mm -hmm. but it would really force out a lot of low-wealth individuals from buying. And so that's why we need multiple approaches to this issue. We need to increase home ownership. We need to provide tax credits to current homeowners. We need to provide micro loan or micro grant um, because when you don't have equity, you don't have the discretionary resources to fix up your home. And so yeah. we need a, a, a whole slew, a whole uh, a portfolio of solutions um, for this issue because you just can't wave a magic wand and increase home price. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. James joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, James. You're on the air. 
Hey, how y'all doing? Um, doing good. I've got a, I've got a little um, analysis. Um, I live in a, um, a, a, a subdivision um, that's part of Camelot and Chesapeake, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I bought my home, I believe, in 2007 or 2008. I bought my house for $145,000. Um, over the years, um, I've seen um, not too many move vaults, but now it's been about 14 years. We've uh, we've got four white um, neighbors in my cul-de-sac, and I noticed when the second neighbor moved in, and then the third, and the fourth, my property value it only went up to I think two thousand dollars, but it did increase. Prior to that, all those other years stay same or they actually dropped sometimes. So that was like, I, when, when we got to four neighbors in the cul-de-sac, I had talked to another, I said, it's kind of odd now that we got four white neighbors in the cul-de-sac that our property taxes went up and our property values went up a bit. That was kind of interesting. I thought after all these other years, when there was only one white neighbor in the, you know, in the, in the, in the cul-de-sac, it's pretty much stayed the same or, you know, kind of like dropped from the 145 that I paid for my house back in old. 0708. Okay, let me let uh, our guests respond to you. Thanks for the call, James. Andre, is that something you've seen in your studies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there's a, a linear, um, in, in research we call this very linear, as the percentage of um, white people in a neighborhood increases, um, the values in, increase. Um, again, there's we're seeing the intrinsic value of whiteness all the time. And so um, in many different cities, you literally you'll see a few white people move in and home prices go up. Mm-hmm. And um, again, and, 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 you know, what's interesting in black neighborhoods in particular, when things go wrong, um, if there's an issue in that neighborhood, everyone always says, um, well, um, those kids don't have home training or, or whatever. You know, there's always a blame of people. And, and, you know, what did you do to your house? The reality is that there's systemic racism that extracts wealth that is vital to community wellness. Now, um, what's what's interesting about uh, um, uh, Carlette's case is that wealth, if she didn't, if she didn't get a, a different appraisal, and her neighbors don't, that's community wealth yeah. lost. That is infrastructure. That is school financing. That is all these other things that you need for a community growth. And so we mm. need to, and I say this all the time, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. That we got to stop blaming black people um, for these issues and start identifying the discrimination that extracts wealth and economic mobility. Mm. Carlette, I see you shaking your head. You agree. I definitely agree, definitely, because, you know, with with um, the difference between the um, the $125,000 appraisal and the um, $259,000 appraisal is, for me, was access to, a hundred well, $10,000 with 125 or 117000 with the 259 appraisal. And so, you know, for me, it... I look at that as someone taking $107,000 out of my pocket, $107,000 of wealth out of my, my family's, you know, ability to use to not only, you know, um, further our, our, our um, ability to generate wealth, but then also to even assist each other in the immediate, you know, mm-hmm. with um, when COVID hit and, and you had families that were, you know, in need. And in my family, it was, okay, now I can help. Now I can help, you know, the people in my family who have um, needs that couldn't get help, you know, from any other, you know, government entity or whatever, just because it wasn't even there. Um, it, it supplies were exhausted, you know, just resources were exhausted. So this was allowing me to be able to be that, that piece for my family. And so I don't want my grandchild to have to deal with, you know, lo- you know, just enormous student loan debt like I did and like I do, mm-hmm. you know, so in order to buy her first home, having to go to a broker versus a bank because of the fact that you do have student loan debt and it kills your debt to income. You know, um, she can 
use these properties as leverage in order to do whatever it is that she wants to do. If she wants to go into her own business, like her mother, like my daughter, um, or if she wants to um, go to school, you know. So this is what was being taken, I feel, from, from me and from my family, you know, in just these two different appraisals by two different individuals. Mm. And, you know, when people are often saying, you know, people say there was something wrong with the third one or, you know, maybe they're, um, um, the, my house is not that value. It shouldn't be valued at that point. And my response to that is, but you gave it to the white guy that was there. You, you did it for when you thought it was a white family there, you, you did it for that family. You didn't mm-hmm. do it for me. Mm-hmm. So regardless of, of what people believe it should be or shouldn't be, this is the reality is that you said that I devalued my own home. Me in person, my own black self devalued my home. But if I were white, it would, it, there was no problem with it being, you know, the higher figure, the higher you. availability of funding. Let's see if we can get another call in. Rob joins us from Brenningham, Texas. Hi, Rob. You're on the air. Hi. How are you? Okay. I just am curious why y'all don't have any appraisers <clears throat> on this panel with y'all today, because there are a lot of accusations flying against the appraisal profession, and we are more highly regulated. We have a higher barrier to entry than any other field that I know of, except possibly for doctors. And so, you know, when, when the gentleman, Andre, from the Brookings Institute says that it's uh doesn't take much to be an appraiser. He's absolutely wrong. And when the gentleman who called in talked about his assessed values going up, that has nothing to do with fee appraisers. And I would like to review the the appraisals, all three of the appraisals that Carletta received. I'd like to review them to see why there's such a great disparity there. You know, I've been appraising since 1983. And at least 50% of the time, I don't have a clue who's buying, who's selling, who owns the place I'm appraising. It all comes down to location. And I don't know if y'all have been in some kind of sheltered environment, but real estate, all real estate is based on location, location, location. You okay. can't, Andre, you can't helicopter a house or a building from one neighborhood to another. You can't. Real estate is fixed in its location, and that's a limitation. All okay. right, Rob, let me let me do this because we're almost out of time. I want them to have a chance to respond to you and to answer your question. We did invite uh, the appraisal uh, community to join us and uh, did not receive a response. So I just wanted you to know that. But let me let Amy and Andre respond to your no, Amy, to your Amy, points. OK, Amy, go ahead. Well, first of all, when you talk about um, the appraisal industry, let me just reference to the lack of diversity in the appraisal industry. This is an industry that requires an apprenticeship program of two years. And as a result of that, then, it's very hard for people of color in particular to get into the appraisal industry. And that helps compound the, the lack of diversity there because what ends up happening is that this is a family profession. And if it's always been a white profession, it's going to stay a white profession. And the result is that there is a lack of diversity in our investigations. When we have um, had complaints come into our office, you know, we've gone on some appraisers, you know, social media pages, you know, and looked at them and seen, you know, their comments about how much they hate Black Lives Matter and groups like that. You can't tell me that then that bias isn't going to be there when they go um, to appraise a, a black person's house. So there's problems within the appraisal industry that need to be addressed. It has not been it, um, this particular individual may feel it's heavily regulated, but there is a serious lack of data that's available, that's available to the public to be able to distinguish what this appraiser has done in the past, the type of appraisals that have been done, what are their ratings uh, as part of those appraisals that need to be um, dealt with in order to make sure that what is being done is fair. Okay. And Andre, we got about two minutes left in this segment. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> for most of America's history, it was legal legal to discriminate against black people. And most of those processes are a lot of what you say, a lot of those processes that were developed during that time still exist. There's this argument that people say, I didn't do anything wrong. You don't have to do anything legally wrong to still have a disparate impact on black neighborhoods. In addition, um, it's clear that data is overwhelming. When I testify 
testified with the appraisers about two, three years ago. And, and Representative um, Al Green asked, is, is there discrimination by it? all of all the appraisers at the, 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 the table? Um, none of them raised their hand. None of them acknowledged. Today, they all acknowledge. So mm. this putting your head in the sand to because it's not just appraisers. It's lender, it's real estate agent behavior, it's um, the overall um, employment. We see the bias in the data. It comes out, and to and for uh, time and time again, uh, for professionals to say that that they're, what they're saying is the data are, are lies. And this, at some point, there needs to be a racial reckoning around the, these issues. Mm-hmm. So, Carla, two less than two minutes. Where are you? Where do you stand right now? Did you go ahead with this last appraisal and and refinance? And are, did. and did you also file a complaint? I did. I was able to um, close out on my grandmother's house um, to keep it in the family. Congratulations! And so there are, with the help of um, Amy Nelson and Fair Housing, um, we were able to um, file a complaint with HUD um, against the lenders and the appraisers. Okay, so you're waiting to hear from back, uh, Amy. Is that where where you are at this point? And if they rule that discrimination did not occur, complaint will end there. If they find discrimination did occur, then it'll likely go to Department of Justice um, for enforcement action on behalf of the United States. Okay, so that's Ms. Homeowner Carlette Duffy, Amy Nelson, Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, and author, researcher, and columnist Andre Perry, Senior Fellow of the Brookings Institution. Thank you all so much for joining us. And and, uh, and Carlette, I do want to say to you, congratulations on being able to purchase your grandmother's home because I know that despite all of this, being able to maintain that real estate and maintain that wealth within your family is something that is very, very important. This is an issue that we will continue to talk about. And so um, until next time, (laughs) you guys, thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. And we'll be right back. I'm with Marcellus, and you all are checking out Another View. Don't go anywhere. Check us out. And welcome back. Our next story may be hard for some of you to hear. We want you to know that it that the content is very tough, but it's a story of African-American life. It's been 90 years since Oliver Moore, a 20-year-old, 29-year-old North Carolina man, was abducted at midnight from the Edgecombe County Jail. Moore had been accused of sexual improprieties with two young white girls. He didn't fight as he was hoisted up a tree by dozens of angry white men, tortured, and some accounts say shot as many as 200 times. No one was ever convicted for his murder. Now, almost a century later, that very tree has been cut down and the wood sold. Artist and guitar maker Freeman Vines purchased some of the wood and talks to our Lisa Godley about the haunting images that surfaced as he carved the hanging tree guitars. Well, I bought some wood from a uh, white fella, and uh, as I was loaded on my truck, he told me, he said, uh, that wood that way you bought, he said, a man would have hung on that tree. I didn't believe it. Southern trees bear strange fruit. 78 year old Freeman Vines would continue his disbelief about the wood until he shared his story with his friend Tim Duffy, who decided to do a little digging and uncovered the bone chilling truth. Next thing I know, he had uh, newspaper clippings and he had done uh, infiltrated the folks and found out that. It was true about the wood. It was, a man was uh, killed on that wood. Uh, shot him 200 times and cut off stuff and stuck in his mouth. And It was horrific the way he died. Vine says he learned that the horrifying lynching happened in 1930, not far from his current home. And the more Tim researched and wanted to explore the area, 
the more uneasy Vines felt. He had the name of the road. He tried to carry me on the road we were killed on, tried to tell me about the folks. I said, tell them I don't want to hear no more now. I said, car, I got to live down here. See, them people still down here right on, and they're a little bit old, but they got uh, relatives and stuff that ain't old, so I didn't want to get too deep in that. But concerns about his neighbors and his own safety was only the beginning. Vines, who has been making guitars for 50 years, experienced something he'd never felt before. It was something strange about that wood, real strange. It had features in there that uh, all you had to do was embellish them with a uh, with a John Brown wire brush, and here would come stuff that would scare you to death, especially if you work nights nice like I do. Most had features like skulls and terror on faces and stuff, snakes coming out of skulls, mouth and eyes and all like that right there. That all I had to do was scrape a little bit to get the bad wood from the good wood, and when I get through scraping, I said, good God Almighty, let me leave this alone. I ain't never had my hand on some wood that had experienced all and seen and heard what that wood had. I went on finished some of them anyway. Vine says he's not certain how many of the guitars he made, but does remember how glad he was when Tim came to take them away for the museum tour. But the story doesn't end there. Tim came up. There was a piece there that I wasn't going to bother with. It had a bad knot on it. So he kept right on and on and on. What are you going to do with this and that and everything? So when he left, I got my mallet and, and started beating the knot. And when the knot came out and I shot one piece on top of the other, it was a shoe. Man, did that get to me. A pure natural shoe. So all I did, glued the top with the bottom, sanded it off a little bit, and the more I sanded and messed with it, the more it became the shape of an old shoe. Now... Here's the little history behind that. Tim told me that the man that they killed worked on shoes because the folks were so poor they couldn't buy no shoes, so he would nail a little stuff over the holes and stuff. I didn't know that. Freeman Vines believes that all of the wood he works with carries a story. For five decades, he's built guitars out of materials that encompass his past, tobacco barns, mule troughs, and radio parts, to name a few. But nothing compares to the story of the wood from the hanging tree. Vine's hanging tree guitars hold a history that is seldom told, one that embodies the horrible acts of racism committed in the Jim Crow South, a story brought straight out of the wood into the world. For Another View, I'm Lisa Godley. Wow. The Hanging Tree Guitars are on display now through September 12th at the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And they will be on display at the Portsmouth Art and Cultural Center starting in the spring of 2022. Just a quick reminder again that if you have a three or four year old and uh, or your child will be three or four by September 30th, now is the time to register for preschool. If you live in the city of Norfolk, you can go to N as in Nancy, P as in Paul, S as in Sam, K as in Kathy 12 dot com. So that's N P S K dot 12. I'm sorry, NPSK12.com and register your child there. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Another View. Uh, If you'd like to hear the show again or share it with a friend, you can visit our website, anotherviewradio.org and download the podcast. Next week on Another View, it's the first day of July, which means marijuana is legal in the state of Virginia. We're going to tell you everything you need to know. Our theme music was an original composition created specifically for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Jordan Christie is our audio engineer sitting in for Todd Washburn. And uh, Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Don't forget, get your shots and join us again next Thursday at noon for another view.
Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at HamptonRoadsCF.org.